Welcome to Cisco Support Community Meetup. My name is Chi Ming Huang, Product Manager for Cisco Support Community. Um, today we are very pleased to have uh, two uh, product manager and one uh, marketing engineer from UCSM team. Um, and then they are going to talk about the new release of a Cisco Unified uh, Computing System Manager 2.2. Uh, we also, it's our honor to have Robert Novak. Uh, as uh, um, our MC and moderator today for presentations. Uh, with that all said, I want to just hand the stage to Rob, Robert. And uh, welcome, Robert. Thank you. Happy to be here. Glad you could all make it. This is going to be some interesting stuff. I've seen a little bit of this, but uh, you're going to be hearing about it from the, uh, the true experts on the matter. So uh, we're going to start off. Uh, with someone I've known for a little while and have gotten some great information from over the years, uh, year and a half, I guess, uh, since I met you at uh, one of the data center events. Uh, Krish Sivakumar has been in Cisco since 1998. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if I should mention the date exactly, but it's pretty impressive. It's one of the few companies around where people can stay that long and do great things and keep, keep growing. Uh, he's product line manager for UCSM. And he's going to be taking us through some of the uh, highlights and new features of our capital Chris? Thanks, Rob. First off, um, thanks for hosting us here. Uh, really appreciate you coming today. And, um, my name is Chris Buckmar. I'm joined by, by my colleagues, Sami and uh, Jason. And they're going to be doing the slides and the actual technical stuff. And we're going to talk a little bit about evolution of UCS and UCS manager itself. Um, and also a little bit about um, sort of you know why we are what we are and you know how we do things. So I'm hoping that for the most part we're going to be pretty much question driven. So you know ask away, uh, no question is you know out of bounds. Most questions are fair. I'll throw out the first question. So if somebody calls you a geek or a nerd, will you feel offended, Rob? You cannot. Participate in this one. So does anybody would. Would you feel offended if somebody calls you a geek or an nerd? We're in good company. <laughs> so that's good. So um, just to kind of give you a little bit of an introduction into what UCS and how UCS sort of came about into Cisco. Some of you probably know this. Um, back in 2009, you know, Cisco entered the market. July 2009 is when they actually first in. Anybody went to VMworld in 2009? No? Okay. You missed a very interesting spectacle. For those of you that have actually been into Moscone Center, mm. um, there's a very, very steep escalator that goes into the show floor in Moscone Center. So if you had been there in 2009, what you would have seen is at the end of this escalator, a big glass wall with a whole bunch of blinking lights that at that point nobody knew you know, what it was. And that was the first production debut of UCS. Right. So we had 512 blades at Moscone Center, um, pretty much running 22,000 labs over the three-day period for all of VMworld. Right. So sort of a little-known secret type of thing, but that was our first production debut. And I still remember a quote that one of our then prospective customers told us. So this guy walked behind the wall, you know, a whole bunch of blinking lights walked behind the wall, looked at the set of servers that were there, and then kind of looked at the cabling, whatever, came back to our booth. You know, we had a you know a chassis, you know, cabled up and you know for, for display. He said, you know, I went and stared behind the back of your wall, which you had these 512 servers. And I gotta tell you, this was the most boring back of the server <laughs> that I've seen. And then, you know, soon enough our marketing guys are kind of like, this is a nice quote, you know, we should write this out. But we didn't quite realize, even at that point, even though we'd been participating in the design of that system, how important that little sound bite was, right? To the extent that we've got things like unified fabric, we've got the whole idea of a single cable carrying fiber channel and Ethernet and management, and it's completely policy control to the extent that I could pretty flexibly decide how much of one type of traffic that I want to allocate to a particular blade and you know how little of something else that I want to do a different blade. So these were concepts that were not in the industry at that time, and you know, it was obviously fairly novel for UCS to go ahead and then bring those concepts out. But we've had a tremendous journey 
starting from that point to today, right? From that first production environment to today. Um, today, we're at about 30,000 plus users. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know how many of you have actually got UCS in your environment in there, <laughs> okay? How many of you um, sell UCS? Okay, and how many of you, I know uh, Gary does that, but how many of you train UCS? Okay. So, to a large extent, you know, thank you to all of you, right? People that have bought, the people that have trained, and, and, and people that use it. Um, we're about 30,000 users. We're actually a $2 billion business within Cisco. To kind of give you a perspective on that, it took Google about five years to get to their first billion. It took UCS about a year and three months to get it to its first billion. Two different markets, two different products, you know, very, very different things market dynamics wise, but kind of gives you a perspective in terms of, you know, how meteoric the growth of the business has been. Um, and as of 2009, um, we were actually dissuaded from entering the market given the fact that our largest networking equipment partners were HP, IBM, and Dell. So they were selling servers, they were selling a ton of our networking equipment with that, and particularly for their Blade products. So if you look at the HP C series Blade products or IBM, you know, B series Blade, you know, um, Blade centers, or if you look at the, you know, Dell M series Blades, we had our switches embedded in them, right? CDS, BBS, fast switches, and on the NDS side, you know, we have the fiber channels, which is never do. So it, it, it's sort of counterintuitive to kind of go after, you know, the, the goose that was laying that golden egg in many ways from a networking perspective. Um, and since that debt, you know, obviously, you know, the debt has actually paid off um, pretty well. But the interesting part about that is we were lumped by IDC in what was the other category for a very long time <coughs> until of May 2013. So, actually, sorry, May 2011. And then it kind of started showing up on IDC's charts as a name, right? But we were not part of other, we were actually, um, you know, in the IDC charts. And IDC essentially is a server counter, right? They do a lot of things, but one of the things they do is they actually report on the server market, right? How big is somebody, how small is somebody, what's the growth rate, and so on and so forth. So I'm happy to note, as of last IDC's report, we are number two worldwide. And we're within a year shot of HP in terms of getting to be the number one blade player in the market, right? So good momentum in terms of customers, good momentum in terms of revenue, great momentum in terms of market share, right? And, and a lot of that is really something that you could attribute to the architecture of the system, right? Because at the end of the day, you take all the pieces out. What do you have? You have an Intel processor, you have some Hynix or Samsung memory, you have a Toshiba or rest, you know, Western Digital hard drive. But how that system gets put together, how that virtual interface card or VIC goes in, how UCS manager comes in, how the unified fabric works alongside, how do you actually take a service profile, apply that, abstract the properties of that server out, that's the magic sauce. That's really what's made UCS what it is today. Right? So to a large extent, you know, Samuel will actually walk you through the evolution of UCS Manager itself, but I want to give you a little bit of a flavor in terms of what has happened with UCS and UCS software, right? So this is kind of what's been happening with UCS business overall. Um, with UCS software, um, UCS has got, at a, at a system level, two pieces of software, right? Um, one piece of software, which you're probably familiar with, is UCS Manager. And the UCS manager, I'm going to kind of use the whiteboard for a second, to kind of set some context on this for those of you that are not already familiar with it. So if you look at it, you know, this is a sort of a prototypical UCS system. So I got something called the fabric interconnect, which is the brain of the system, typically deployed in pairs. And then I've got a bunch of chassis that are sitting beneath that fabric interconnect that are you know, essentially connected to that fabric and everything. And then I could actually have multiple of these sitting in my environment. And as Rob would attest, not only this, 
you would actually have a bunch of rack servers that are sitting here that can also be connected to this fabric interconnect. So from an architecture standpoint, this was the first ever time in the industry that there was a common management platform for both racks and blades that actually provided you complete flexibility in terms of how you would manage your deployment, how would you operate that environment between blades and racks, right? So blade servers, rack servers, both managed through a single interface and using a set. Going back to that software comment, two pieces of software, one that runs on top, that essentially is your UCS manager. One instance of it for an entire domain. Technically, two instances of it, one on each fabric interconnect. But operating in an HA mode, so you actually literally talk to this one active instance at any given time. Right? So the active and passive instances are always talking to each other. They kind of keep each other up to date. And the active instance presents itself through a web to, the, to your clients, right? uh, a virtual ID. That's UCS manager. So the entirety of the software that's actually running in here is really a version of NXOS, the exact same NXOS that you see on all of the Nexus switches that you have. And then the UCS manager essentially gets bundled on top of it. And this piece, we call it the infrastructure bundle. Right? And if you look at image name terminology, we call it the A bundle. Right? So if you go to just.com, uh, uh, you can actually go ahead and then you know download the A bundle. And that A bundle is really what's got the NXOS software and UCS manager. Question. Uh -huh. Can you explain the um, network service manager, the uh, NV, which is northbound, I guess, the API? What is it? Is that part of this uh, service manager? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. So UCS manager um, architecturally has got you know, the, the core application, right? And that core application presents itself through an XML API, right? And that XML API is the be all, end all interface. The reason I say that is, if you look at the overall architecture, you've got the basic application that's actually sitting in here, UCS Manager. And then, like I said earlier, you've got the API that's sitting on top. And then on top of the API is all the other elements that you typically get to see. Right? The CLI, the graphical user interface, Partner products, you know, we have every center, you know, system center operations managers come from Microsoft, a whole bunch of partner apps that actually sit on top. So architecturally, it's UCS manager, which has that API, and then everything else that sits above the API. And I don't know, Jason, you're gonna talk about partial in, in your bit, but um, you know, you could, right? So there's a there's, there's a whole lot of things that actually happen um, with there. So to kind of go back to your question about NSM uh, specifically. You could think of NSM as an application that's actually sitting in here, Network Services Manager, that to the extent that it needs to actually do something with the UCS infrastructure, it could simply use this API to do that. Right? So we have integration with a number of Cisco's own products that do management that integrate through that API. Does that, does that answer your question? Is vCenter one of those? vCenter is absolutely one of those, yes. Is that, is that uh, VMware or is that Cisco's? VMware, vCenter is VMware. Yeah. Right. So vCenter server, which is kind of the official name for that product, essentially sits on top here. Um, no, no, no. I, 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 oh, I know what the vCenter is. I, I got confused. Uh, the uh, uh, eCloud. eCloud orchestrator? Yeah. Is that, is that, is that Cisco or is that? Is no, that, that's, that's VMware as well. Okay. So right. how does B B call fit in? Yeah, so VMware's got a a a product suite, if you think about it that way, right? So VMware vCenter is an ESX manager. B, you know, Cloud Orchestrator is sort of a layer that's actually sitting above that's doing a variety of orchestration stuff to actually bring up VMs, shut down VMs, you know, doing that type of stuff. So, so the uh, um, um, <clears throat> NSM is above B Cloud. 
Are you talking about NSX? No. OK, uh, that's, that's a VMware also, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, does, does that fit in this uh, UCS at all? Yes and no. I, I thought that was sort of like a competitor. To yeah, yes and no. That's why I kind of, you know, there's a little bit that fits and a little bit that doesn't. So well, I'm glad you're here to clear that up for me because it was really. Sure, 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 sure. Um, so this topic is really not related to UCS, but certainly, you know, in the context of overall compute, I do want to talk about that, right? So VMware offers a set of network services. Right? So today they offer a service called vSwitch. Just I think all of us are familiar with it. You know, there's a hypervisor called ESX, and there's a networking layer within that switch, you know, within the hypervisor called vSwitch. VMware also offers other variants of the switching layer. Um, you know, most common thing is being you'd hear here called VDS, right? VMware Distributed Switch, which is basically an instance of this switch that it can be distributed across multiple physical servers. Right? You need to get an enterprise plus license to go ahead and enable that, that sort of stuff. But more recently, VMware you know, acquired a company called Nasira. And as part of that acquisition, they actually got a piece of technology that allowed them to go ahead and then create a software networking layer that was technically their network hypervisor. Right? So you can think of it you know, in a very simple way as a network hypervisor. That technology, uh, by the way, the VDS technology is very complementary to Cisco in the sense that our own Nexus 1000V, which is a virtual switch, sits on top of VMware's VDS. Right? It's a very, very complimentary, you know, kind of work together. We co-sell that all day long, that sort of stuff, right? With NSX, the game changed a little bit, right? With the Nasira acquisition, the game changed a little bit. Um, so even though we are very, very complimentary at the VDS level, with the NSX, there are a set of things that are VMware and VMware only. And that set of things do compete with Cisco. Right. So that's why you know it's a bit of a yes and no. There are parts of VMware that can compete with Cisco. There are parts of VMware that you know we get along with really, really well. Right. Okay. Just something to throw out. If you're talking about NSF, <laughs> I think that's from our friends up in Sunnyvale. Yeah. The J folks, who I won't name here. That's actually not a. That's kind of what I thought too, but I yeah. didn't want to bring it up. But yeah. So that that's it's a different problem. And not Cisco. Yeah. And not VMware either. Right. So um, we, we certainly talk about that offline too. Right. So um. We'll do that. So kind of going back to this, um, so that's sort of the A bundle. Um, so when you, when you think about UCS manager, runs inside Fabric to connect, it's all embedded so there is no separate server that you need to run UCS manager on and that sort of stuff. And then on the blades and racks, there's another piece of software that we call it the server bundle. That runs on the blades and racks. And the server bundle obviously can come in two flavors, one for the blades, that's the B bundle, and then one for the racks, called the C bundle. So for cuteness sake, you see a software is SEC as ABC. Okay. So that's sort of you know, how, how that's laid out. Now, what happens if I have a lot of these? So if I have a couple of fabric that connects and a bunch of chassis with CCDs boxes and kind of connect them all together, great. I've got that single instance of UCS manager, life is good. However, let's say I have multiple data centers, or I have multiple instances of UCS manager in a single data center because you know I've kind of run out of space on this thing, so I put another one, another one, another one. Potentially, that could become a problem given the fact that you're individually managing every UCS manager at the end of the day, right? Even though it's a very powerful environment, it's still Scope limited to that one domain you're managing that's underneath that first pair of fabric interconnects. So how do you make that problem simple? Right? So about a year and a half ago, we introduced another product that essentially sits on top of this called UCS Central. And as the name would imply, its sole purpose in life is to essentially give you the management capability through a single pane of glass for multiple UCS managers, independent of you know whether they're distributed across multiple data centers, whether they're in the same data center, doesn't matter. You essentially get that same single policy framework that allows you to go ahead and then define policies, deploy them onto your UCS gear from one place. Right? So this product has been 
shipping for the last about a year and a half. Uh, it is just about ready to come out with its next version, um, literally in a week, week and a half. Really bad, right? So, um, so that's you know very successful in terms of you know dealing with management at scale. Right? The third piece of software. So we talked about the rack servers coming into the fabric interconnect in a kind of like Rob's environment. However, the rack servers also can kind of sit by themselves. You know, just like the pizza boxes. You know, the, 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 there are tons and tons of you know server pizza boxes that are sitting there. So I can take a CCD server, rack server, and have that guy just sit by itself, connect that to any old switch. Right? Perfectly legal, perfectly valid. You know, not all rack servers have to be, you know, connected back to a fabric interconnect. So there is a piece of software that runs in kind of the equivalent of this C bundle that runs in here. You know, for one of a better term, we're going to call it the CCD's standalone software. Right? So from an overall portfolio perspective, you have UCS Central that is managing multiple domains. You have UCS Manager that is managing a single domain, which is a collection of the fabric interconnects, the blade chassis, and the rack, chassis, rack, rack servers. And then you've got the standalone software that is essentially managing that single <coughs> server, right? the rack mount pizza box server uh, that's actually sitting out there. Right? So that's sort of a portfolio. So what Sami is going to talk about today is really focused on UCS Manager and sort of our latest and greatest uh, releases of UCS Manager. So I want to pause for a second on that one, Rob. I want to throw a quick question out for, yeah. th this is something that confused me the first three or four months I knew it existed, so maybe we can avert some other people embarrassing themselves like I did myself. Where does UCS Director fit into this? Yes, good point. So it's going to be, so uh, perfect. There's, there's some, some uh, a term um, that is primary. Good question there as well. So yeah, let's Where, talk about the full term? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Prime is a suite of products, so I'll kind of explain that, you know, how that works oh, okay. in a second. Yeah. So let's start with UCS Director, a good question, right? So hopefully everybody's clear in terms of you know, what these things do and you know how they fit and so on and so forth. Now, let's say I have um, a need not just to manage my compute environment, but you know I have, let's say, um, I don't know, uh, a Nexus 7000 that's sitting here. So I'm going to take UCS Central off the map for a quick second. And let's also say that this fabric interconnect is connecting to, you know, an MDS or a brocade for my SAN. And let's say this guy is connecting to a storage array of some sort somewhere else. <laughs> and there could be a, a storage array here, an Ethernet storage array, a fiber channel storage array, you know, whatever it is, right? This is something that you would fairly commonly find in every data center, right? I've got my compute. I've got my network, I've got my SAN, I've got my storage. And let's kind of add for completeness sake the VM that's sitting inside the server. So this is something that you would actually very commonly see where you know I've got all of these pieces that exist as part of my infrastructure. So the real question becomes, how do I ensure that I could actually go ahead and then manage all of these pieces? The pieces being compute network, storage, and virtualization. UCS Manager does a phenomenal job at actually dealing with the compute part, as long as it's within the UCS domain. But I've got other networking pieces um, that are there, you know, sitting, in, like say, in the uplink switches and so on and so forth. I've got storage pieces and I've got virtualization pieces. So UCS Director is a product that essentially allows you to build workflows that manages the entirety of the stack. Whether you buy the stack as a bundle with one of our partner offerings, like a VCE vBlock or a FlexPod, or if you build it yourself in terms of you know, all of the component parts, the UCS, the, the, the LAN, the SAM, the storage, and so on and so forth, either way, UCS Director becomes a product that can actually go ahead and manage that stack. And to do that, UCS Director effectively uses 
UCS manager, assets compute manager, right? It uses UCS manager as compute manager. It could very well use products like BCMM, assets network manager, uses a bunch of, uh, actually BCMM itself for storage, you know, VMware vSphere, um, vCenter, assets virtualization manager. So it basically talks to all of these individual domain level management entities, but presents an overall unified workflow for you to go ahead and then manage that entire stack. Right? So that's you know what UCS Director is. So hopefully it kind of gives you an idea in terms of what that product does. And UCS Director is something that came in as part of an acquisition that we did of a company called Cloudia. So if you're familiar with a company called Cloudia, UCS Director is nothing but the Cisco brand of Cloudia. Um, that brings us to the question of Roin. How many of you have heard about Prime? So Prime is a relatively new terminology for Cisco in the sense that you know it's been around for the last three, three and a half years. What it is is basically a suite. Cisco has always had a set of network management applications, right? Things that do network discovery, things that do uh, network troubleshooting, things that do network performance monitoring, things that do uh, topology and you know. Analysis and all kinds of other things. So these were all point products. You know, NAM is an example, a network analysis module. All of these were point products that did very specific functions within the network. And even from a look and feel standpoint, you know, they were all you know kind of all over the place. Right? Um, Prime was essentially an initiative that looked at the spectrum of networking management products that Cisco had and essentially brought that spectrum of network management products together under a single umbrella. Similar look and feel, complementary feature sets, roadmaps that are actually aligned among the products so if there is interdependency between one product and another, it's easy for you to start managing that. And that's really what Prime is. So if you kind of explode Prime, you'd actually find things like Prime Performance Manager, you know, Prime Network Analysis Manager. Prime uh, you know, land manager and so on and so forth. So there's a number of uh, prime data center manager, right? BCNM. So this would, you know, essentially go to a number of individual products that have those specific functions that they perform, but would all roll up into that single umbrella called Prime. So hopefully, you know, that kind of you know answers that question. So that's UCS director. That's UCS manager. You know what 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 Prime is. Um, and so on. Any, any questions? Yes. Uh, so you talked about the VMware uh, vCenter, which is uh, running on top of this. Uh, With an API relationship, yeah. Yeah, an API relationship. So pretty much uh, I can uh, manage all my uh, virtualization and, and uh, computing platform, which is underneath using the vCenter. Yeah. How UCS Manager is adding a value on top of it? That, that, that's a very good question. So. Um, there are two things that happen there, right? So one is if you're familiar with UCS and UCS Manager and the VIC, which is the virtual interface card that sits inside of UCS, um, I could go ahead and then create a virtual interface in the VIC to go ahead and then connect a VM to, right? To give you an example, I have a server. The server could be a Rack server, a Blake server, doesn't matter, right? So I then have a virtual interface card inside that server, the VIC. Right? The VIC comes in you know, a variety of models, you, know, you can get a 1240, 1280, so on and so forth. Now, one interesting property about this VIC is the fact that I could take this card and then create a number of virtual interfaces, right? Up to 256 of them. And these virtual interfaces can actually be vMICs or vHVAs, depending on what I want. Right? Do I want data connectivity, storage connectivity, whatever. Right? The reason that's important is if I'm on VMware vCenter and I'm trying to bring up a VM, it's likely that that VM is sitting here on the server and then connecting to one of these interfaces. right? The question is, okay, so how do I configure the properties of that interface? It needs to be on a certain, certain VLAN. It needs to have a certain QoS policy associated with it. Whatever the set of properties are that are associated with that interface need to be known, right? So the way to get that known is within UCS Manager, 
I can define something called a port profile, which then allows me to define what this interface needs to be. And through the API, I could simply export that port profile to VMware vCenter. So if I'm a VM administrator, I'm coming into vCenter. And then when I come into vCenter, I basically get a list of port profiles that have been previously defined within UCS Manager. And as a VM administrator, I'm simply picking it and saying, I want to just use this port profile. Let's say that port profile is called SAP. I don't know, whatever, right? SAP goes to VLAN, it's got a certain you know, set of network policies associated. This then talks to that same API. And as the VM gets placed on the blade, that port profile automatically gets defined. Very simple operation, very simple way in which that bidirectional communication allows you to simply expose a set of network properties as text labels at the vCenter level. That's one integration. The second integration is there is a plugin that goes on that allows you to look at vCenter and the physical properties of the server, including the service profiles and so on and so forth, from within the vCenter GUI. So you essentially get a window view of all things UCS from within the vCenter GUI. Right? So that plugin has been available for a little bit of time as well. So two different types of integration that's come on. So, so yeah, I, I've got a, a point. So as an administrator, he is going to have like both of GUIs on his vCenter. As well as the, you see, the manager, yeah. to manage the host. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what's the difference between a, a BIC and a um, network, a converged network adapter? Good question. So, um, the BIC is basically a Cisco converged network adapter. And CNA right? is VMware? A CNA could actually come from a variety of corners. Um, so, you know, uh, examples would be. They do the same thing, right? Well, yes and no. Um, it would be a, a VMware thing because VMware doesn't make hardware. Yeah. But for CAD, HP, Q Logic, Q -Logic you like. I'll tell you what's common and what's not. So, the thing that is common is the fact that they bring Ethernet and fiber channel physically together, right? That's common. Mm -hmm. Meaning, these are all technically Ethernet cards that are talking FCOE, right? The thing that's not common is this virtualization that's going on on top of the card. And um, the ability for you to do things like VM Direct, which is basically a piece of technology that allows you to bypass the hypervisor completely from a network stack perspective. So there's a significant amount of value add that comes in on top of the basic CNA functionality, which is really bringing Ethernet and Fiber Channel together. So the, the VIC goes on, on a mezzanine? mezzanine VIC can go on a mezzanine. It could actually go as a PCI card on a rack server. Depends. So it comes in different form factors. So if you just buy a blade server, that, that's a different part number than a blade server with a VIC on it? Um, it's a sub part number. So blade server itself does not carry a VIC enabled part number. Um, so you would get a you know, blade server because you have a bunch of choices, right? So when you get a blade server, you have a choice of adapters. So you would actually add that as an option. Okay. Right. Just something I didn't look into yet. Absolutely. Yes. Too many things. Yeah. Cool. That's Rob, time check. Uh, we're running pretty close to the next move. Definitely want to give you a chance to finish up. Okay. And I want to let people know that our, our speakers, I believe, are all going to be hanging around a little bit afterwards. Yes. So if you have further questions, uh, by all means, hang around, have a cookie or a brownie, and uh, feel free to ask your questions after the board as well. Yeah. If you, if so, you don't get enough detail or if you think of something later, like you want to ask him what the difference between uh, a bit and T81 is. So the quick thing, and I want to you know, let you know, and you know, Sammy will kind of take it up from there. Um, so if you think about UCS Manager, um, our first version of UCS Manager 1.0 came in. You know, it feels that long time ago, but you know, it doesn't seem like sometimes that, that long. Um, came in, you know, July 2009, and ever since we've actually kind of been marching along. And the specific release that you know Sammy's going to be talking about is a release that's called. Two to one, right? And there's been, you know, a myriad of releases between the two. Um, you probably also noticed that there is a name that Simon has given to this release called El Capitan. So internally, we tend to refer to these names, and there's a little bit of, you know, art and science with these names. So just kind of, you know, want to let you know these are all 
beach names in California. Um, so our first ever beach name was Aptos. Second beach name was Balboa. Third beach name was Capitola. Fourth beach name was Delmar. And this is our fifth with El Capitan. We already have our F and G, and we're taking suggestions for H. We don't have one yet. So if you've got a good California H beach name, let us know. It'll become a UCS product. Sorry? Huntington. Huntington. Got that? All right. Um, plus one. Plus one. Yeah, plus one. <laughs> um, so if a year from now, a year and a half from now, we come and talk about Huntington, we'll, we'll, we'll do, do great at that point. Right? Um, so these releases, the way to think about them is there's approximately one major release every year, right? A major release, you know, kind of, you know, terminology wise, I'm going to pick this guy. Right? So this is kind of what you would see. Major essentially kind of affects either this number or this number. I'll kind of explain that in a minute. And then this one is called a maintenance release. Right? And then typically, there would be a letter that will follow that as well. Right? So this is kind of the major minor designation. So every year, you could expect to see one of these numbers bump. Right? You got 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, 3.0, so on and so forth. Right? So that kind of goes on. Within that year, it's possible that this number, the maintenance release, gets bumped two or three times. And the maintenance release is primarily focused on bringing in new pieces of hardware, or collecting a whole bunch of you know, smaller capabilities into one release. Right? So that's really what those maintenance fees are. And patches, I don't have to tell you, you know, something was wrong, the patches. Right? So you'll probably see this nomenclature on Cisco.com and you go download any of these components, right? Infra, server, VC, nothing like that. All of those will follow that same uh, you know, terminology so you kind of have major, minor maintenance of the patch. So that Capitan is basically, you know, if you think about it, you know, we had Aptos, Balboa, Capitola, Delmar, El Capitan. That's that release. Right? It's the release that has actually come up after about five years, or actually four and a half years of shipping um, UCS. So it's a fairly mature release. And one thing that we do a lot of is try to get feedback from folks that use UCS and then incorporate that into our releases. In as much as you know, I want to take Huntington back, we also want to hear about your experiences in using UCS, good and bad, right? Um, good is good because we know that we need to do more of that, but the bad is better in the sense that we need to kind of go fix something, right? So for those of you that are already UCS users, one appeal that we would have is tell us what you like Tell us what you don't. Um, we would like to kind of get those addressed as well. Right? So with that, I want to send it out to Sami. Uh, I'm going to throw a quick comment out here. Uh, for those of you who don't have a UCS pod at home or at your office to work with, if you want to play with some of the technology here in a similar, simulated environment, there's a thing called UCSPE, or Platform Emulator, that you can download for free from communities.cisco.com. And it gives you an opportunity to look at how the configuration works, how UCSM works, how the API works, how you deal with hardware, both blade and uh, rack mount. Uh, it's completely free. You do have to register for an account and confirm an email address. But it gives you an opportunity to play with upgrades, play with configurations, profiles, all sorts of things, uh, without taking down your production environment or spending more thousands of dollars than at least I have for my home lab. So with that, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, oh, about a decade less, but still a distinguished time at Cisco, we've got Sami Zachary here, who is a product manager for UCS Manager. And he's going to take us through some of the uh, features in 2.2. Thank you. So uh, my name is Sami Zachary, and I'm a product manager with UCS. Uh, I focus primarily on UCS Manager. So piece of software that sits in the Fabric Interconnect uh, to manage the whole UCS system. Uh, this is going to be a more scope controlled uh, you know, uh, presentation talking about the latest release uh, 
El Capitan uh, 2.2. Uh, we released El Capitan uh, back in late December time frame. Uh, and so uh, it has pretty much the latest and greatest of all the features that we have in UCS Manager. You'll see focus on enhancements all over the place. So we're trying to enhance on a fabric level, on the operational level, on the compute level. So if I could, do I have like control for the slides? Or? Yeah, you can. You can. You want to uh, move the slides? Or, or, or I'll tell you just next time. Okay. So next one. So um, again, please feel free to stop me anytime, ask any questions you want. Uh, like I mentioned, we're trying to focus on different enhancements buckets. Uh, on the fabric level, what, what we mean by fabric enhancements is those feature enhancements that do tackle, uh, you know, um, challenges at the fabric level, at the NXOS level, at uh, the VIC adapter level. So everything that is networking feature related uh, in the aspect of UCS. Uh, we look at operational enhancements, and these are the type of enhancements that we do to make the life of a system admin, of uh, someone who's operating, deploying UCS, a lot easier. So, you know, management, operations, stuff like that. And the last bucket, we're looking at compute enhancements. So things we do at the BIOS level, things we do to manage various compute elements uh, in the UCS system. So this is, you know, the way we group uh, those features. Kind of, you know, there is, you know, a thin line, you know, you could look at things as being operational and compute at the same time. It's just a way for us to make it simpler and easier to deliver the content. So we go to the next, please. So we'll start with the fabric enhancements. Uh, and first on that list is, um, thank you. So uh, first on that list is going to be fabric scaling. And uh, fabric scaling is primarily looking at supporting larger customer environments. So uh, you know, we're starting to expand the number of VLANs supported in a UCS system, the more number of IGMP groups, virtual interfaces. Uh, network adapters that can exist within a single domain. So those are the things we're trying to look at. And if you look at the table here, you'll see that prior to El Capitan, prior to 2.2, uh, the numbers were about 1,000 VLANs, 2,000 virtual interfaces. Uh, 1,000 VLANs are doubled in El Capitan to 2,000. Uh, we added more virtual interfaces. IGMP groups are quadrupled to 4,000. Uh, network adapter endpoints, meaning physical adapters that you can support within a single UCS domain uh, are also increased from 160 to 240. Uh, this also applies to PHBAs uh, that are you know, supported within a single domain. So again, supporting large customer environment, service provider type environments uh, you know, or for large IT you know, departments. So um, if I go to the next door, yeah, well, that's awesome. thank you. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next on the list is IPv6 management. and. Uh, this is typically a request that comes in RFPs for you know government, you know federal government uh, type you know uh, accounts, where there is a request to support IPv6 management interfaces, whether it's on a fabric interconnect on the uh, UCS cluster itself or on the servers on the same uh, you know on the servers. And so what we're doing with IPv6 is with exposing, with enabling IPv6 management on a fabric AIP, fabric B, the cluster IP address as well as allowing you within UCS Manager to create pools of IP addresses. And these pools can be, can be IPv6 pools. Uh, and you can assign these to, to the SIMC. Uh, SIMC is Cisco INC, Integrated Manager Controller. This is the board management controller on, on the servers. Uh, the other thing we're doing is we're also allowing access to external services, such as you know, NTP uh, over IPv6 DNS. Uh, other clients running on, on the fabric, such as Secure Copy, TFTP, all of these are also IPv6 capable. Um, oh, perfect, thank you. Much better. Uh, next on the list is Cisco UTLD. And, and UTLD is um, a Cisco data link layer protocol. It's called unidirectional link detection. And what that protocol, protocol is trying to do is allowing us to detect any broken bidirectional link in in the, in, in the configuration. And optionally, disable such a broken link to avoid any loops in the system. Um, the way we're integrating Cisco's UTLD into ECSM is by exposing some of the um, specific parameters that you can set for UTLD within a global policy. So Chris talked about UCS Manager. Uh, you know, at a generic view, it's a policy-based management uh, uh, application. 
And so we do manage all of our servers through defined policies. An example that Kish talked about is how much bandwidth do you allocate to a specific interface on a specific adapter. So one of the other policies here is going to be the UTLD, uh, setting the UTLD parameters from within UCS Manager. Um, so next on, on the fabric enhancements is um, a couple of features that help us do I.O. performance acceleration. And so uh, what we're trying to do is, in this case uh, of user space, enable a set of applications that we call high-performance computing applications. And those applications uh, require a lot of compute, but at the same time, they require low latency on the I.O. side. So that is required and enabled through a property of our Cisco Vake adapter uh, that Chris talked about, uh, which is called user space link. Now, what user space link is allowing us to do, if you look at that picture on the right-hand side, is it allows us to bypass the network stack in the Linux kernel and have the user application talk directly down to the adapter, hence achieving <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, for those of you familiar with UCS Manager and, and, and policies in UCS, <laughs> VNIC templates and VNIC policies in UCS Manager, you'll see a new policy that is called uh, a VNIC USNIC connection policy. So this allows you to set different parameters for USNIC and UCS Manager. Um, some other users are Windows users, and Windows does have another I.O. acceleration uh, feature called virtual machine queues. Uh, again, we're supporting virtual machine queues in, in, uh, in Alcatitan by uh, supporting those different transmit and receive queue pairs uh, where the network traffic gets distributed across of these and again helps you know, with I.O. acceleration by distributing that traffic across multiple vCPUs. Uh, in the same way, it also does offload some of the packet filtering to the adapter itself. So that, again, allows you know, uh, better I.O. performance uh, in those cases uh, for Windows virtual machine queues. So uh, this is the set of fabric enhancements. Again, remember, we're talking here about VIC enhancements, fabric enhancements, absolutely, I get to you, and, uh, and uh, I.O. enhancements. So we talked about fabric scaling, uh, IPv6 management. We talked as well about UDLD, uh, integration in UCSM. We talked about US SNCC and we talked about VMQs. Please go ahead. So you talked about the policy management, right? So in the policy management job, is it possible to configure a policy per flow basis or per port basis? What what is the guideline level I can go? So uh, in that case, in, in the UDLD, there was a global policy and a per port policy. So uh, explain that up. So you'll see that we have a global policy and a per port policy that were applicable. So you can do that in that case at a global level. So you can configure a policy across all of your, you know, your domain and your your your, your environment, or you can go for a specific port and tweak those parameters and assign that policy to that specific interface. So um, this is one case, but other policies from within UCSM have again scope control, right? So some of them apply globally. So we have a set of policies that are global across the UCS domain. Uh, I'm going to talk about an example of that in the, towards the end of the presentation. And some other policies are very specific to a specific interface, so a VNIC that we define on a, on a VIC adapter. And we specify all the policies as far as, you know, talk about QoS policies, uh, uh, VLANs a lot on that VNIC. So we get to specify to the VNIC level. Okay. Is UDLD supported both? Uh, Obviously, probably upstream to the switches, but then also downstream to the chassis as well. I, I do believe so. You mentioned the endpoint when it's went up from 160 to 240. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that you can have more than 160 machines in a single UCS instance, right? No, that's not that's not the case. So, um, what these numbers are reflecting, they are reflecting the number of adapters, physical adapters on on a server. The domain is restricted to 160 servers, but that's a restriction that is not really dependent on the number of adapters. That's by definition of our system. This is you know testing limitations. Uh, we have limited the, the size of the domain to up to 160 servers. With the introduction of a product like UCS Central, 
that really does not become a limitation because when we when you think about it, the, the way we like to think about it is this is a legacy chassis that was getting a 16 server in the past. Now it is a virtual system that is getting 116 server, 160 servers with a single management point, right? Um, so with central, we extend that up to 10,000 servers with a single management point, UCS central. So the idea of whether the size of the domain is 160, 200, 300, doesn't, doesn't really matter that much. Any other questions? All right, so we'll, next, we'll get to the next uh, set of enhancements, the next, next uh, bucket of enhancements, which is the operational enhancements. Uh, the first one on this list is, is addressing the C-series integration into UCSR. So remember when Krish talked about that, he mentioned that this was the first platform that allowed you to manage your blade service and rack service under a single management application. Um, we have evolved a lot the way we're managing the rack service under UCS Manager. Um, in Delmar, which is the previous release, the El Capitan, we introduced a feature called single wire management, meaning we carry management for rack mount servers, management traffic and data traffic across along a single link, all the way to the fabric interconnect. Now that required that you use a fax in the middle, a Nexus 2232PP fax. And uh, this was a requirement. It was very much similar to the way we have a chat with what we call I.O. modules, faxes in the back that connect to uh, the fabric interconnect. Uh, the rack mount service connected to a fax, which is equivalent to the I.O. module in the case of a blade, and all the way to the fabric interconnect. What happened is some customers had a majority of blade deployments, so primarily mostly blades, and a couple of rack servers that they were running standalone or managing otherwise. And when they looked at integrating that under UCS Manager, it meant for them to purchase a fax in order to be able to connect those to the uh, fabric interconnects and manage it under UCS Manager. So we started getting requests about supporting those rack mount servers and connecting them directly to the fabric without having to purchase a fax. So being able to integrate it directly from the port on the adapter of the fabric interconnect of the rack mount server all the way to the fabric. This is really what we enabled in El Capitan. So you'll see that here's your rack mount server. You're connecting your adapter port, carrying management and data traffic all the way to the fabric interconnect. Now, there is an econo economical trade-off here, right? So there is a port license on the fabric interconnect, and there is a number of rack mount servers that you have. So if you have a handful of them, a couple, three, four, you know, it might be more economical for you to do that. Otherwise, you know, as you start looking at getting 10, 20 servers, maybe the fax is more economical. From a technical standpoint, nothing limits you from getting all rack mount servers and connecting them directly to the fabric. You can absolutely do that. Um, we're also looking at strengthening the logins into UCS Manager. So this is a feature called two-factor authentication. Uh, and for those of you familiar with the three factors, uh, this is something that the user has. It could be, uh, for instance, a credit card uh, or perhaps a token, something that the user knows, something like a password, and something that, that the user is or, or does, right? Uh, so it could be like your fingerprint or whatever biometric uh, you know, that, that, that you provide. So in this case, we're looking at a token-based implementation. So something that the user has, uh, so you have a generated token along with a password that you used to log into UCS Manager. So your logins are now username, password, and a token. And we have done this integration with, you know, uh, we've tested with RSA Secure ID and Semantic Vip Enterprise <laughs> Gateway. So these are tested, but again, this is a standard implementation. It should work for, you know, tokens in general. I think also Chris talked uh, about an example of vCenter integration and what are the benefits of that integration. So the same way we're doing that integration for VMware vCenter, we're also extending that to Windows customers. So um, people that are using Microsoft SAVMM, I meant to say Microsoft customers. Uh, people using Microsoft SAVMM can also get the same benefits, the same integration benefits of configuring and getting you know, the hardware, the infrastructure level information into SAVMM through a plugin 
that Cisco provides into a CDMN. And uh, with that plugin, what you'll be doing is pulling all the fabric and the network definitions from UCS Manager into the SCDMM. And the other thing that it allows you to do is to push into the various Hyper-V hosts the VMFX forwarding extensions. And what that allows us to do is configure that feature called VMFX that, again, Chris talked about, which allows you, allows a virtual machine to bypass the virtual switch in the hypervisor and talk directly to the adapter. So you're getting your traffic switch at the hardware level instead of getting switched at the software level and eating up CPU cycles. Now, because of that features uh, of that feature, we managed to achieve a lot of performance benchmarks. Uh, as it turns out, switching the traffic in hardware, even though you go outside of the chassis, ended up providing much better performance than switching traffic in the software layer in the hypervisor. This feature has been supported on Hyper-V hosts prior to Alcapitan. It was not integrated into SCDML, meaning if customers wanted to use that feature, they have to go to every single Hyper-V host and configure it manually. So what we're doing is we're bringing the central management in the picture in, in, this, in, in this feature and allowing the integration with UCS Manager and SCDML. Uh, <clears throat> A couple of features coming up are about management aspects, pure management aspects. The first one is called SIMC in-band management. So we talked about SIMC being the Cisco board management controller on the service. Um, and here we're talking about server management. And what in-band means is, on the red line, you can see here, uh, I'm not sure if this is So the red line is your management traffic flowing along the uplinks. So these are the data uplinks whereas the blue line is your management interfaces. So that's your management network and your data network, if you want. What we're doing here is we're allowing management traffic for the servers to flow and take the same path as the data traffic. Now, what are the benefits for this? First of all, you're a system admin today. You have your server admins. You don't want, you don't want their KVM traffic to flow along your management interface. So you provide the separation of server management from system management. The second thing is, by doing that, you also relieve some of the bandwidth available on the management interface for pure management of the system. And lastly, as it turns out, we talked about enabling IPv6 management in the beginning. As it turns out, this is the only way you'd be able to do IPv6 management of your SIMC servers. So if you wanted to manage your servers over IPv6, you'd have to go through the in-band interface. Now, this is supported for all of the SIMC sessions, meaning if you wanted to do a KVM console, a vMedia session, a serial overland session, all of that is supported over the in-band management interface. So that kind of means that you can load your ISOs over 10 gig rather than over 10 100. Absolutely, yes. Yes. And also relieve the other one. Mm -hmm. So on the same management, better management policies, if you will, uh, we're also providing the ability to get access to your KVM directly without having to go through UCS Manager. Um, prior to El Capitan, if a user wanted to access their KVM, uh, they either could do that from within UCS Manager itself so you could launch KVM on the server from within the, the, the GUI of UCSM. The other way to do it was, was using uh, the KVM launch manager. And a third way, a programmatic way, was providing a URL. But that URL needed to have the IP address of UCS manager embedded in it. That implied that as a system admin, if you wanted someone to access the KVM, a server admin to access the KVM, you needed to hand out the UCS manager IP address to them in order to allow them access to KVMs on the servers. So customers that didn't want to do that started requesting, I want to be able to just specify the IP address of Cincy in the URL bar and get access to my KVM. And this is what this feature is doing. It's basically the Fabric interconnects are hosting those Cincy IP addresses. You go through a web interface, provide the IP address of, uh, of, of Cincy, 
and get access to your KVM. You use the same UCS manager logins, username and password, so you have to authenticate against UCS manager, but you'll be able to just specify the KVM IP address to get to the KVM. Um, I believe this is the last one on the operational enhancements. Um, firmware management has been some of the, you know, one of the key uh, values of UCS Manager. How we make firmware management much simpler and easier. And one of the things that we can do from within UCSM is manage the firmware and completely define the firmware uh, on your service through policies. So in a policy, you get to define the BIOS version, you get to define the firmware on your hard drives, you get to define firmware across the board of every single element in your, in your system. But we also look at the aspect of upgrading firmwares on the system itself. So upgrading your UCS manager, uh, bringing in a new fabric interconnect, forming a cluster, how do we sync the, the firmware on both of them, uh, bringing in a new server into a, a domain and updating the firmware to make it consistent with the rest of, the, of your domain. A lot of these uh, operations uh, have been more or less manual historically, meaning a customer in order to upgrade had a lot of steps to do. In Delmar, we introduced a feature called firmware auto install. What that did, it was a wizard-like upgrade of the firmware on all of your system, making it much easier and simpler to upgrade the firmware uh, and automate the upgrade process. In the maintenance release following Delmar, called Delmar MR1, we introduced another enhancement where you automate a fabric interconnect, bring in a new fabric interconnect into your system to form a cluster. You no longer needed to take it in standalone mode, bring it at the same firmware level as the existing active to form a cluster. What we're doing is we're allowing the new fabric interconnect to sync itself, synchronize its firmware to the existing active. In El Capitan, we're extending that to servers. That define what firmware goes where. Now, this is a coming new server. What it does is, as, as, long, as soon as it's discovered in your system, the firmware is pushed automatically to it based on what you define in your policies. Now, a lot of customers will say, I don't want this. I want to be able to define the firmware manually myself. Uh, it's an opt-in feature. We're trying to make your life easier and make it more consistent, but it's an opt-in feature. You can either choose to acknowledge it yourself, turn it off, keep it on. The one thing that we expect is we do define the service in a construct that we call a service profile. And a service profile use a, uses a firmware policy. So if you do have a firmware policy defined, we will never touch your server. So as long as this server is not associated, we will go ahead and apply the policy if you so choose to. All right, so um, we talked about um, C-Series Direct Connect. We talked about integration with Microsoft SCVMM. We talked about uh, in-band management, CMC in-band management, direct KVM access, and Lastly, we just talked, and we talked about two-factor authentication as well, and lastly, we just talked about server uh, firmware auto-sync. So again, a set of operational enhancements, we look at this as making the life of a system admin and a server admin a lot easier to manage, operate, deploy a UCS system. So the last set of enhancements are compute enhancements, and you know, like I mentioned, these are enhancements around BIOS, uh, around uh, boot policies, how do you want to boot your system? Enhancements around firmware on the compute elements. Can I push firmware to my hard drive? Uh, things like that. And we'll talk about these uh, in detail again. Please feel free to stop me and ask me questions if you want. The first one on these is around secure boot. Secure boot is a standard defined by the trusted computing uh, group uh, following the UEFI spec. And we are implementing that uh, with UEFI Secure Boot in El Capitan. Um, what Secure Boot is doing is really allowing the BIOS to authenticate every single driver before loading it to make sure that on a Secure Boot enabled platform, you have a chain of trust and you can uh, authenticate every single image you load. The way we're exposing that in UCS Manager 
is through the boot policy. So we have a policy that defines various aspects of boot. And one of these aspects is the security, the boot security. In order to do that, you would go ahead and enable the UEFI boot mode, and then you have a checkbox enabled about secure boot. We'll talk about boot policies in general, but a boot policy not only defines a secure boot, but also defines your boot order. And so, let me jump to the precision boot order control, and then I'll come back. Uh, the second enhancement here is precision boot order control. A boot policy, like I mentioned, defines how you want to boot. Um, some people do that through the BIOS. They go to find their boot order. But this is allowing you to do it through a policy in UCS Manager. Associate, assign that policy to a server profile associated with your server. And your server has the flow of where I'm going to try to boot first. If that fails, what is my next boot device in the boot order? Prior to El Capitan, these are the boot options that you have. In terms of local devices, you had either a local device, a CD-ROM, a floppy. In El Capitan, this is becoming a lot more precise. We're giving you options in terms of selecting a local one. Perhaps I want to boot from an SD card, a USB device. You get to select on a very granular basis what kind of boot device you want in the system. Not only that, but we're also adding local and remote vMedia. Uh, so I have a local CD, a, lo a remote DVD, local and remote floppies, a remote perhaps blog device that I want to have. Again, prior to Al Capitan, if you had, and, and this is not a recommended practice, but just one example, if you had a local device as a boot device and send boot in the same policy, this was not very deterministic, and it's not it's not a recommended practice anyways. But here, whatever you define, we guarantee that the actual boot order on the server is going to reflect exactly what you've defined in that list. I also want to talk to you about some enhancements we're, we're doing as far as monitoring local storage in the system. Uh, our local storage prior to our capital has been limited. <laughs> I see you smiling. Uh, it has. Uh, Primarily, we were looking at presence and operability states of local devices. We knew it was limited, and um, there were some challenges in, 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 in enhancing local storage. And that was because a lot of other vendors are doing local storage by install, installing host-based utilities in your OSs. And we, were, we have a philosophy of being an agentless management solution. You don't install any host-based agents in your, in your uh, environments. And in order for us to monitor local storage, we had to load some utilities in our own OS that we boot prior to booting your OS. So we get all the information from the LSI tools and so on and so forth. What we've managed to do in El Capitan is we're defining what we call an out-of-band communication channel. That channel is be between our board management controller, our SIMC, and the rate controller on the board. Now, what that allows us to do is, in real time, as you're running your OSs, you can go from the out-of-band communication channel and get all the information about local storage controllers, local disks, uh, perhaps virtual drives as well. Everything that can get exposed from the storage controller itself is available to us through that channel. So no host-based utilities whatsoever on your systems. These are kind of the examples of what you can monitor. So you can monitor all aspects of local disks, including disk rebuild operations. So if you have a RAID rebuild that is happening, we can monitor that as it's happening, tell you what is the progress, what is the percent progress uh, for that operation, consistency check, and so on and so forth. Right. <clears throat> Another monitoring of storage, local storage, is SD cards. Um, prior to El Capitan, we have enabled manual boot from SD cards. And um, the way we've done that, uh, that was because a lot of customers had requests to do that. They wanted to be able to boot ESX off of an SD card. And so 
what we've done is we've allowed customers, kind of pre-enabled them to go and from within the BIOS set up the SD card as, as a boot device. In the second level boot order feature or precision boot order control that I talked about, we've integrated the SD card as a boot device in the boot policy. So you no longer need to do the BIOS work. You just come here through the boot policy, specify the SD card, it's in there. The second thing that we've done is we've enabled monitoring of the SD cards, meaning monitoring of the what we call the flex flash. This is how we call it, the flex flash controller, and monitoring of the SD cards themselves. So you'll see that all the parameters, states of, of a controller, of an SD card controller, as well as the cards themselves, are being monitored in UCS Manager. Um, on top of that, we've also enabled mirroring of dual SD cards. So if you have Two SD cards, you want to mirror the data on both of them, this is also enabled in here. I talked about firmware management, pushing firmware to hard disk drives, pushing firmware to Fusion I.O. flash adapters, LSI flash adapters. Um, without that, you have to automate a bad uh, hard drive if you wanted to kind of uh, flush the firmware on it. So what we're doing is we're allowing you to get any fixes to firmware and flush it, update the firmware in the field through our firmware policies. We're also enabling monitoring of one of the modules on, on the servers called the Trusted Platform Module, the TPM. So um, the way to monitor the TPM prior to El Capitan has been through going into the BIOS, seeing if the TPM is present on the board, if you know what are the various parameters. Here it's all integrated in the inventory of UCS Manager. You get to see all the information for the TPM. And I know I'm, I'm probably short on time, but this is my last, uh, my last feature. Uh, we're also looking at DIM errors and enhancing our DIM error reporting and guaranteeing or at least trying our best to make sure that customers are running with good DIMs. Um, DIM technology has been changing in the field. It's been shrinking. It's exposing a DIM to a lot more correctable errors. Um, what we're doing is we're employing better algorithms and improving our accuracy at identifying a DIM as degraded. Um, so that's one aspect of the feature. The other aspect is called DIM blacklisting. And what DIM blacklisting is about is um, imagine a situation in which you have a DIM that hits an uncorrectable error, crashes your system. Upon reboot, this DIM goes through what's called a BIOS MRC check or post. And unless that DIM fails post, nothing is going to map it out. There is a possibility that that DIM is going to be up and running in your system, exposing you to yet another crash. So what we're doing in here is we're trying to keep track of historical data of bad DIMs that could have crashed your system and forcefully map it out upon reboot so that we make sure that you're not running with a bad DIM or a DIM that we know is bad. This is an opt-in feature. Um, we've introduced it in a previous release through reporting. So we're trying to also, along that feature, enhance our DIM reporting. So a DIM comes back to us. We want to do some failure analysis. We do record some of the correctable error, uncorrectable error counts, stuff like that, on a DIM memory called the SPD memory. So that is part of keeping the historical data. Another part of it is providing this policy that allows you to make that DIM blacklisting uh, take effect. So if a DIM were to crash your system, I don't want it. It's an opt-in feature. You can go ahead and enable it. It's going to take your DIMs out if they're bad. So um, just a quick recap. Uh, we just uh, talked about secure boot. We talked about precision boot order control, enhanced local storage monitoring through the out of band communication channel. We talked about SD cards. We talked about flushing the firmware on the hard drives, as well as the Fusion I.O. Uh, and the flash adapters. We also talked about DIM blacklisting and enhancing the, 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 the accuracy of the grid DIM reporting. So, uh, oh, there's a pointer here. <laughs> so before I, uh, I pass it on to Jason to cover some of these and show you some demos of these features, 
Uh, are there any questions? Got one for you. I, I like the Fusion I/O feature with the firmware upgrades integrated. Uh, it would it, it would make my life a lot easier if when I do bring a new machine up, I can do all of that firmware at once. But how do you deal with driver tie-in? Because you have to have OS drivers that match the firmware version that you got. Is there anything either current or in the works for that that you can mention? So. I'll let Chris comment on that more, but um, we're managing firmware on the infrastructure. Okay. We're not pushing drivers along with the firmware and host devices. So that's beyond the scope of the management of what UCS Manager is trying to do. Um, not to say that it, it, it's, it's a valid you know, ask. This is something that you know, other tools do exist to push drivers. Um, we tend to define what drivers uh, through what we call a compatibility list, we do define what drivers go with what firmware version and stuff like that. Uh, but this is not within the scope of what we try to do uh, in UCS Major. I don't know if you want to comment on that first. The good question is exactly that there's a little bit of a church and state separation that goes on in UCS. We, we participate very heavily on the back end infrastructure of everything that happens, right? whether it's BIOS, whether it's hard drive rate firmware, whether it's you know now Fusion IO firmware, exactly. that's a church form. The state part is actually the last. So we're pretty much, you know, um, kind of disassociated ourselves, so to speak, from the OS, the driver, and so on. And it's part of the unit system, which means they can actually add a new OS and get them there. So. Um, one way to kind of synchronize them is, you know, as much as we're actually putting a policy to go ahead and then flash the firmware in, the API allows you to read the firmware back. Okay. So if you have an OS build process mm -hmm. of some sort that's actually injecting a particular driver, right. you could very much query the current policy mm -hmm. that you have for the Fusion IO firmware, and then through that build process, you can simply match up the driver version with that firmware version. I like that idea. So that's oh. one way to do that. Okay. We're also looking at it from the third-party integration side. There are a lot of tools out there in the industry for pushing drivers mm -hmm. on the Linux side, on the Windows side, yeah. exactly. So finding ways to maybe you know cut up, package our drivers in such a way that they can be easily programmatically queried and pulled down, and, and also pushed from these third-party systems. Yeah, I, I definitely like the this, the church and state separation. I know some vendors are very proud of being able to push drivers into your OS. But as a sysadmin with more than three or four servers, I, I want to know when new drivers get installed because bugs happen, people still write code for the most part. And if I would rather know that a new driver is going out rather than getting a note from my management structure saying, oh, by the way, we pushed this new driver. We hope you like it. So definitely cool. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, we take a lot of effort. You know, so sort of this look my no hands. Mm -hmm. We kind of need look my no stations, right? And we've kind of been in that mode for a while, and we anticipate to continue to be in that mode for a while. Okay, cool. Are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, last but not least, from our uh, Cisco friends, I believe this gentleman may have been involved in UCS longer than anybody I know. Well, I started in, uh, in, let's see, I came over in May of 2008 um, to Nuova Systems that was acquired shortly after by Cisco, and that's, you know, ultimately we built out the UCS technology. Uh, so my name is Jason Shaw. I'm a technical marketing engineer. I focus on systems management for UCS, and I actually work with a lot of our customers and partners that are doing, you know, automation or integration with our XML API, as well as helping with our UCS manager releases. Um, identifying what type of features we need, you know, testing them, vetting them out, getting feedback from customers, and you know, sort of feeding that back into the product. Um, so what I have today, uh, relevant to the presentation we have, is one uh, a quick couple of slides just showing the direct attached C series topology, um, comparing that to the laptop. Just come around this way. Actually. So I've got a slide or two showing uh, the topology and how it's changed and, and what we support today. And then I also have a couple of videos highlighting some of the operational features that we were talking about earlier. Actually, the compute enhancements, like the uh, local disk monitoring, uh, the new precision boot order control. So uh, you see the first slide here. 
is actually our current, our new architecture. This is UCS Manager 2.2, uh, which again supports direct connections from the rack mount server to the Fabric Interconnects without the need for Fabric uh, for Fabric extenders. And again, some of the use cases that this particular topology is meeting are those customers that maybe just have a few rack mount servers, don't necessarily need the fixes. Makes sense to just plug a couple of rack mount servers in without the added expense or you know the added uh, you know you utilizing the additional space and cables as well. Um, and if we go back to you know two major releases, we've got the 2.02 uh, release, which again is you know still supported. You can see 2232 fixes dual wire connected, so we actually had a separation of control plane and data plane going to the 2232 and then uplinks from the fabric extender to the fabric interconnect. Um, we made some great improvements when we moved to 2.1 because we took the, the, where we had two cables, one for data, one for uh, control plane, we combined those together and just had a single 10 gig connection going from each server to the 2232. And really, if you, if you look at the 2.1 release to what we have today, we just took the fexes out or the opportunity to take the fexes out where it makes sense. So again, there's the basically the three supported technologies, you know, from from the 2.02, the 2.1, and then the, on the previous slide, the 2.2 release. There we go. Let's get this full screen. Through okay, the, yeah, the resolution might be a little tough here. Um, let's see. I think I do do some zooming in, so hopefully that will, uh, will help us. So here's the uh, here's the new pre boot policy screen that we've added. Again, this is in 2.2. Lots more. Um, again, a, a much more deeper breakout of the local devices. Where previously we had just really the high level devices like local disk and such. We've added broken up the local disk entries down to individual local LUN, you know, your traditional local disk, but very specific entries for booting from FlexFlash, the SD card, if you have that, and or booting from either, you know, an internal USB card, we do have USB headers in some of the blades, or an external USB, so either from the dongle on the front of the blade, or even from a, a USB card that maybe you've plugged in your rack mount server. And as we move down, you know, new uh, CD DVD devices, either locally attached, maybe on the dongle of the blade, uh, or even from an external uh, USB attached CD ROM drive, maybe on a rack mount server. Same concept with the floppies as well. And then, uh, as Sami mentioned earlier, you can see two different boot modes there. Uh, there's a UEFI radio button that you can select, which enables that checkbox for um, our secure boot functions that we're building out. So for customers that are interested in, in pursuing uh, secure boot, you'll see certainly the new features that we've got available in the boot policy and, and certainly more to come as well. So I think we've got just a quick example of adding those devices in. Again, you can build very granular boot policies now. Um, multiple instances of the same device in some cases. Maybe you've got two USB sticks and you want to actually have a preference of which one to boot first versus uh, second. Those were things that we couldn't do prior. So that's the, uh, the boot policy enhancements. This next video has some of the local disk, uh, you know, some of the inventory changes that we've made. Let's bring this one full screen. Great. So uh, I've got a couple of rack mount servers here under UCS management. I think I've got a C200 M3 with uh, one of the Mega Raid uh, PCI controllers. I've got um, a super cap or a battery backup uh, for that. So we're going to go through the inventory and show uh, you know some of the detailed information that we bring out. Um, if you're familiar with um, local disk technologies and uh, a lot of the utilities that the vendors provide, you get very granular information out of this adapter. And we've basically, again, created that communication channel from UCSM uh, to talk directly to that controller on the, uh, on the RAID controller and bring that information into UCSM without the need for host agents or running any utilities. I'm actually going to show the running OS with those utilities running 
so you can see you know how the same information is present in both and also how quickly when I make changes at the OS how quickly those changes surface in UCSM they're, they're really in near real time uh, so here's my RAID controller breakout you know very detailed info um, support for tracking those long-running operations if your battery goes into learning mode you know there's a period of time that it takes where your virtual device goes from uh, right back mode to right through mode. So, you know, that's just the nature of, of, of RAID controllers. It's nice to be able to have that information here and know exactly what the status is on the RAID controller. There's our, our Flex Flash controller. So, you know, detailed information on the Flex Flash controller and also the adapters. And uh, when you open up some of these some of these drop downs, um, I can see my you know what local disk policy I configured in UCS Manager, uh, as well as what the actual disk configuration is you know on the RAID controller itself. Just in case you know maybe I've configured the server a certain way, but some changes were made in the OS, I can I can see those differences. I can get you know very granular info uh, about the attached drives, whether they be spinning media drives or solid state drives, whatever's attached to your RAID controller. So I'm, I'm going into the operating system. I've got Linux in this case. I'm opening up the LSI utility, and I'm actually going to create a virtual drive on the RAID controller so I can see uh, what that looks like in UCSM. So I'm going to, I believe I'm taking two drives, well, uh, probably three drives. I'm creating a RAID 5. There's my virtual drive created. I'm using Camtasia for the, for the capturing, so I am uh, shaving some of the time down. But when I shifted Windows here, it, it literally is in near real time. I'm going, I was in the KVM for the server, I switched back to UCS Manager, and when I come back here and actually look at the, the actual disk configuration dropdown, which was empty before, now I've got VD0, that virtual device that I created. You know, with all of its information, it was a RAID 5. Um, my caching information, you know, at the bottom, support for some of those real-time, uh, you know, possibly long-running operations. I know that my my virtual drive is in an optimal state, meaning all the drives are, are present and actually um, you know, functioning. And I believe what I'm actually going to do here is yank one of them <laughs> so we can see the state change as well. So below the um, virtual drive, here are all my, my individual um, attached drives. And I can see that the drive state, um, it's, it's a little tough to see on the video here, but um, previously, my drive state was, I think, unconfigured. Now, a couple of these drives are actually online because they're being used, you know, by the RAID controller in the in the virtual device that I created. And in this, the next part of this video, I'm showing some of the new faults. We've got very, you know, detailed again uh, when events happen related to the RAID controller. You're getting them in near real time. If I pull a drive, I'm going to get an equipment missing fault um, that's going to be raised in the system. I'm going to get a fault that my virtual device is degraded as a result of my physical drive being pulled. Um, I'm getting both of those here. And uh, should I go ahead and reinsert that drive, um, restore the problem, I'm going to see states change you know, shortly after. Um, the, de the degraded state of my virtual drive is going to go away once I recover that problem. Um, and again, support for those long-running operations. You know, when you do replace a drive, it takes a period of time to sync all that data back. And I can see a rebuilding state. And a little further down in this window is actually literally like a counter or a progress meter I can follow um, and ensure that, one, it's still rebuilding and uh, where it's at in the process and how long it's going to take, potentially. So that's the local, local drive monitoring aspect of the feature that we built in. I'm going to walk through a couple more areas of uh, inventory here. So we talked a little bit about uh, TPM, the trusted platform module that's inside the servers, uh, and that's relevant to things like BitLocker, drive encryption, and, and such. That's a device that sits on the motherboard and needs to be configured. And prior uh, to the 2.2 release, oftentimes we'd have to open up the KVM, um, configure the TPM, make sure it's, it's on, it installed for one and present, and then also configured. Um, we can actually get the information, the status of the TPM in UCS Manager without having to go into KVM anymore. So a great convenience for folks that use that. And I believe the last piece I touch, uh, touch on is just showing the, the new policy related to dim blacklisting that some may refer to earlier. So again, this is a new feature that you can turn on. It's a, it's a system-wide policy when you enable it. 
we'll do very granular tracking of the DIM, specifically tracking all the uh, error counts historically and allowing us to make much, you know, much better decisions around when uh, DIMs are in a state that we feel is degraded and uh, preventing some particular scenarios that we mentioned earlier where uh, one particular case being um, you have a, a, a DIM that encourages an uncorrectable error which will crash a server. Uh, you certainly don't want to have that server come up and just that DIM happen to pass post and put you in a, in a scenario where you, you could have a second failure. But this, where you'll see that this feature exposed is in the statistics for an individual DIM. When I go to the event counter, we see uh, a pretty lengthy set of statistics um, tracking at a, you know, at a granular level the um, correctable ECCs, uncorrectable ECCs, and again, we're keeping these statistics long term uh, even after the server reboots. We'll be tracking these statistics in UCSM and, and able to make, uh, you know, again, much better choices around uh, when things maybe have failed a short-term threshold or a long-term threshold. And I think that is the last part of my video. So I just I wanted to, again, quickly go through maybe about 15 minutes or so, cover uh, some of the features that we talked about here. Um, we actually have a lot of these videos posted. Um, I know there's blogs related to um, LCAP, but also on our communities page, communities.cisco.com. Um, we do a lot of feature development um, and, and try and showcase them in the form of, uh, of videos and blog posts. Any, any questions that I can answer? Yes. Um, and I know we were just hit with a with a bug recently. A new version of Java came out. Um, you know, had, had some undesirable behavior. Um, that is a common, uh, definitely a, a common request that we get from customers. And I can tell you, we are actively on a path. Um, I, I think we would also like to move away from Java. It's it's a work in progress. Um, but I, I can tell you that it's it's being looked at in, in um, UCS Manager, in UCS Central, um, and I've seen some mock-ups. It's, it's a very active project. Um, I don't have any time frames for when uh, you'll see us fully off, but uh, I can tell you that it's you know it's definitely a hot topic. Can you ask a quick question like this? With, with group is, can you look at your environment or your customers' environments? Um, within their data center, when you look at all the applications that they have, are there significant Java footprints within those enterprise apps that they're running, or are customers actively migrating off of Java from a UI perspective? Can, can somebody kind of give us some insight into that? I would say the former. We, we do have a lot of Java in other uh, management and application areas. Uh, we found these servers would like to uh, diversify and get some things that are a little bit more lightweight. Uh, but not all of our software vendors are on the fast path to that. We use Oracle. So, oh, yeah. They have kind of a bit of a message just now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. um, would that be true for Flash as well? The same comment about. Flash-based application rules. Uh, I don't know if I, if I use them. This one. Okay. It, it, it's been a while. I think it might have. Yeah. I can't remember the last time I used Flash Blue in any of this stuff. Any, anyone else using Flash-based Blue? Don't use Flash-based Blue. I don't know. And one other quick thing to note is that it, 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 it's probably not the uh, the easiest solution, but you do if you have UCS, you have access to the UCS XML API. So technically, you can write your own front end to it in whatever you like. There's Python, there's PowerShell, there's a lot of different ways to get in there. It's not quite. It, it wouldn't necessarily be as polished or as ready to hit the ground, but. You know, if you have known things that you have to do, or if you have an orchestration or a control framework that you want to tell how to react or reboot or query a system, you can do that through the XML API. And, and, and you know, anything you see in the GUI is automatable. 
um, using those using those exact SDKs, and we have some great tools along with those that will monitor the Java GUI log, um, allowing you to go back, you know, make the change that you want to learn how to automate, and uh, we'll basically provide you that command syntax for either Python or PowerShell or Go UCS, one of our other um, uh, SDKs. But uh, you know, our our GUI and our CLI that we've written are clients to our XML API. Um, so you again. Uh, We've written the GUI, but ultimately everything you would ever want to do in the system is available through the API, which can you know can be uh, everything can be automated basically. Okay. Uh, then, if there's no other questions, once again, our our guests will be hanging around after the meeting, and you can ask more detailed, more specific, or later remembered questions for a little bit afterward. Uh, I want to remind everybody real quickly, there's a meeting evaluation form you should have gotten when you came in. Uh, please do fill out that form and return it. The, the folks here want to know how this meets your needs and uh, you know who they're, who they're able to reach out to and how, well, how to tune future presentations. So finish this off and uh, turn it in before you leave. And I want to introduce uh, David Darrow, who's an account manager with Skyline ETS. Everybody. Um, yes. Yeah. Let me remind everybody. So we're having a free drawing for a free five-day class for thirty-five hundred dollars. And it's some little fishbowl right there. So I know there's a Be uh, Beats Air Foam. Yes. The, the Beats Air Foam also free yes. drawing. Yes. Right. Probably two drawings. But yeah. there's the uh, little fishbowl there. Um, is there a clicker? Okay. Oh, okay. So I'm going to run through this really quick. Uh, this is 124 foils down to 35. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's just going to be a few minutes. So has anybody ever taken a class from Skyline before? Anybody? Okay. All right. So let me run through this really quick. Please interrupt me if you have any questions. Uh, big picture about the company. Um, we're actually a Cisco Learning Partner. We're actually called a Specialized, which is actually the, the highest level. Uh, we're actually one of very few partners that focus 100% on Cisco. There's several, there's hundreds of learning partners out there. Uh, I think we're only one of very few that has a focus of 100% Cisco. That's all we do is just Cisco. We resell VMware classes. We probably should teach them. We don't. Uh, we just basically teach Cisco. Uh, we're actually, I think, the, the largest Cisco-centric learning partner there is. Been around for around 25 years. We pretty much focus on advanced technologies, and we definitely do the certification courses. Um, but for the most part, we you know focus on the product courses. I mean, there's some people who might come to us that want to take a CCNA class, and if they're looking for us to help them pass the test, we're probably not going to help them very well. There's a lot of companies that do that. We're there to kind of talk, uh, you know, teach the technology. Uh, different awards over the years. Um, we're actually a Cisco Gold Partner. Uh, I think there's only two companies in the world that's asking that actually a Cisco Learning Partner and a Cisco Hardware Partner are actually both. Therefore, we do professional services. Um, these other areas here on the right, I'm going to go a little bit more detail. Um, in regards to longevity, our employees, our management, you know, most of our uh, employees have been around for quite a while. Average years for an instructor, more like about 10. Uh, I'm a sales rep. I can give you the best class at the best price, but when it comes down to it, it all amounts to having a good class, quality instructor. I don't mean anything. So uh, I can tell you that probably 90% of our instructors are either full-time employees, or if they are a contractor, they're like a full-time contractor. We teach them like an employee. So for the most part, we're very stringent on you know, the people that teach our class. Um, we also write books for Cisco Press. Here's a couple screenshots of some ones we've done over the years. Um, in regards to the courses that we offer, you know, it's pretty much the, you know, the main four central areas uh, of Cisco. I would say probably about 90% of all Cisco classes that are out there we actually deliver. In regards to the data center, here's a section right here. These aren't actually the classes, but more kind of like the umbrella. And I'll go in a little bit more detail about that in a second. Um, the other thing is uh, we're also a course developer. And why it's important for me to tell you that is because there's hundreds of learning courses out there, and there's a lot of learning partners out there. Believe it or not, Cisco doesn't really technically develop all this content. Um, they're responsible for it for the most part, but what they'll often do is they'll subcontract 
a learning partner like us to actually develop content. And then what happens is uh, when the course is done, it takes a long time to develop a five-day course from scratch. Once the course is done, it's just goes IP. We give it back to them. Then all the other learning partners, our competitors, have the ability to teach it if they want to, if they want to make the investment in the hardware and the labs and the instructor. The only difference is if we're developing a course, you know, we're working with the BU for a long time and we feel like we know this content pretty well. Um, now this is just, you know, I have a list of maybe 50 courses I think we've developed over a number of years. Here's just in the data center right here. We actually wrote the first UCS troubleshooting course. Um, and let me see here. We actually did a PowerShell course, which is not there. UCS PowerShell. There it is right there. Um, yeah. Let me see. In regards to our training that we do, really three main areas. One is we do teach classes via WebEx. Okay. Uh, I would say that maybe 10% of our training was delivered to WebEx maybe five years ago. Now it's more like about 50%. We're really happy with WebEx. And uh, we're not pushing it because we want customers to take it via WebEx. People are demanding more classes to be available on WebEx. Now when we teach classes on WebEx, uh, we don't merge with a classroom. And what I mean by that is, if there's a classroom in Campbell with nine people, we don't let three people come in on WebEx. And the reason why is we kind of feel like those three people might be on an island somewhat. It doesn't always work that way when we've tried it, but for the most part, we made a decision several years ago that it's either all WebEx or it's all classroom. So if there's a WebEx class and 12 are in the class, all 12 people are WebEx. Uh, the other thing is, well, normal classroom, you know, in the different cities around the United States. Um, we do open enrollment in the United States, but we do private classes worldwide. Um, the other thing, we do remote instructor-led training, and I don't like the word remote. That makes it look like a WebEx. What I mean by remote is, is we do it where we have two classrooms, for example, like one in Chicago, one in Campbell. We have two big flat-edge screens, a little bit smaller than that, in the classroom. An instructor in one of the um, classrooms, and then each classroom kind of see each other. We don't do a, a lot of that, but we can do that. Most of it's probably 50% WebEx and rest this. Um, let me see. Typical, you know, I'm, I'm sure people here taking Cisco classes maybe haven't, but for the most part, we're talking about you know classes about five days long, very lab intensive, 50/50, roughly $3,500 retail price. Um, we also do private classes, and matter of fact, a big percentage of our training really is actually on-site private classes where we have the ability to customize the content. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I hear the word customization, that means to me as a consumer more money, and normally it doesn't. Really what it is is a lot of times we're, we're taking some content out. Maybe there's certain features on UCS that of the five-day class that you're not needing, so maybe we can take that content out. Maybe sometimes we add some content in. So we do have the ability to do that. Um, a big question that everybody asks me is like, okay, um, how many people do you need for a private class? Normally my answer is that whatever you would normally spend to maybe ship six or seven people out for an open enrollment class and what you would spend for the training as well as the travel, which could be about $2,000 per person for a whole week at airfare and things like that if you had to fly out of the area, then you're probably a candidate for an on-site private class. Um, let me see here. Yeah, that's all I have there. In regards to um, uh, Cisco data center classes, um, a big chunk of our business is data center. Um, and uh, we've been focused on it for a long time. Uh, we own probably, I think, all of our classes, just about for all Cisco technologies. We, we own our own labs. We're not renting labs from somebody else. Maybe 90% we own our equipment, and the other 10% are written from somebody else, which gives a lot of flexibility. Um, and in regards to, I'm going to pretty much flip, I think these are our core data center classes. And when I say data center, of course, I mean UCS, Nexus, MDS, CAT, 6K. But in regards to UCS, because that's kind of what we're talking about here, I'll just kind of quickly go through these. The very top one is ECUCI, which is a 5 day implementation class. And there's a troubleshooting, and there's a design class. Okay. Um, these three that are underlying happen to be courses that we actually developed. It's not official Cisco content. It's something that we felt like the market needed, so we developed it. So course number four, UCN UCS. Um, UCS Quick Start, okay, that is really not a class. It's, it's, it's really more of an implementation. And usually um, we have Cisco partners maybe contract us to do an install 
and we do kind of an installation knowledge transfer. It's not really a class. Um, PowerShell, another class we developed. Um, let me see here. We were talking about UCS Director a few minutes ago. Uh, here's the Foundation CAD class and an advanced class. And then also, uh, we, we're developing this right now in OpenStack. Anybody use an OpenStack at all? Or anybody thinking about it? Okay, all right. Uh, there isn't very much training that's out there. Um, we call it an OpenStack deployment on UCS. Probably 95% is really a fundamentals class. But we talk about the accelerator packs and the UCS installer, I think it's called. This is going to be done in about probably 30 days. Um, Nexus, Nexus 7, 5, and 2, MDS, Nexus 1000. Okay, we also, as I mentioned, we do, um, we're hardware partners, so we do professional services. And it's kind of a eye chart of all the different areas of Cisco that, you know, we can do professional services on. So if there's any one foil I'd want you to remember, and that's this one here, and that is, here's our value right here. Not only competent to teach Cisco courses, but our guys are also, since we, you know, we're a hardware partner, we do implementation, our guys have real world practical experience versus just doing training all the time. And then the ideal situation is maybe taking a class from an instructor who's not only competent to teach that material, maybe he's one of the guys that does professional services, and who knows, he might even be one of the guys that was on the team that developed the course. So what else could be better than having all of this? Of course, you're not going to get that for every instructor for every class that you take, but that would be the ideal situation. Uh, learning credits, I always get this question. Anybody are you aware of learning credits and how those work? So just so you don't know, um, learning credits are sometimes given to you when you buy hardware. Sometimes you buy them. Um, the Cisco Learning Credits Organization changed a few things a couple of years ago. It used to be where credits are good for 12 months. It used to be that um, if you hadn't used your credits by the 12th month, you would go to a learning partner like us and we would give you like a Skyline credit. Well, they changed that, and now the training actually has to be completed before the 12 months. So I tell people that if you're going to take a Cisco class, regardless of what learning partner that you use, and you got learning credits, you want to try to at least enroll in the class by the first six months. Because if a class cancels at month 11, and then you know, all of a sudden and they expire, then you, know, you could be in a jam here. Another thing I want to mention, because you're all right here, and better time to save right when we're here, um, all these learning partners that are out there, we all cancel classes, okay? But we all, you know, don't get paid until a class is actually delivered. So um, people say, well, how many people need to run an open enrollment class? And it's not really the number, it's more like the revenue. I think in general, we try to put people in class states and locations that have the best chance to run. Uh, but we can't, we don't need 12 people, but we, don't, but we can't run a class with two. And so what we tell customers is that you can, once you're enrolled in a class, you can cancel and reschedule as many times as you want, but up until the two weeks, then you can't change. You've got to stay in there. On the other hand, if we're going to cancel a class to a low enrollment, we'll let you know no later than two weeks prior to the class date. Um, that was quick. I paired my foil <laughs> set down pretty good. Anybody have any questions? What I've, got, what I've listed um, uh, on the table here is a couple things here. Here's my business card. Uh, there is a brochure, there's a voucher, a $750 voucher for a class. Uh, this is a little training me metrics here. Um, and, you know, the last thing I want to do is give you guys a whole bunch of 40-page outlines on the courses. This is just kind of a, a quick overview of all the key courses, you know, the name of the course. Um, uh, if anybody wants a soft copy, send me an email, I'll send it to you. You know, the name of it, the type of student would take it, number of days. So it's a kind of a quick cheat sheet. Probably, this is the 80-20 rule. We've got 100 classes out there. This is probably the 20 that we are the most popular ones. I have a question. Yes. Is it possible to stop by your facilities and take a look at the, your labs? Yes. Yep. And just, also, just some, call you and sort of yes, yeah, we're in Campbell. Um, all of our classes are done. I mean, we've been teaching the cloud for years. I mean, all our classes are remote VPN. I don't think there's any classes that we teach anymore where we bring all the gear in. Yeah, we have a data data center lab just for our data center class. Is it possible to um, 
sit in for an hour or two? Yes. Yes, I should have mentioned that. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, you're a good salesperson. You work for Skyline or what? So, no. So, uh, no, you can't. If you want to audit a class, if it's WebEx or even if it's in classroom class, you certainly can. I can't give you a course kit. They're about $500 each, but you can certainly come in and, you know, uh, watch and observe and see how we do things. Are there any courses aligned with the CCI for data center? I'm sorry? Are there any courses aligned with the CCI? Uh, CCI? Yeah. For the um, yes. Yeah. I, um, I might be talking about something. Yeah, I think there's going to be some new courses coming out on CCI data center. And I think that's in the middle of being changed right now. If you send me an email, I'll let you know what we have. Okay, great. Okay. David, do you want to help me out with the drawing here? Uh, you're going to pick it, not me. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's good that I don't yeah. pick my so I guess, uh, and, uh, I guess Can I just uh, oh, um, yeah. thank for uh, the team? So today we have a critical support community team, a uh, few team members here, from Oliver. Uh, he's actually our UI designer. So if you look at our website, you know, design, a lot of things, also our mobile app is done by uh, Oliver. And his side job is the uh, audio video engineer. Um, we also have a Sam. She's helping like uh, right. sign up. She's our um, website content program manager. So she manages a lot of online uh, webcasts and also ask expert uh, events online. Um, and so she's our cameraman. I also have video <laughs> camera woman uh, here, Crystal. And Crystal, is that right? Crystal. Crystal, yeah. She's our um, partner program manager. So if you want to work more closely with uh, Cisco Support Community as a partner, you can help with her too. Um, no, okay. And I think there's one other person I was supposed to introduce, Jacob uh, Van Weck, I believe it is, has just joined, the, joined Cisco as product manager for UCS Central.